Hey everyone, Crimson here. I just wanted to take a moment to address two points from part one of my Reaper's Creek review. The first part was Julia's relationship with Daniel. A lot of people in the comments section were under the assumption that Julia was actually Daniel's sister. This is actually not the case. Julia was just some random girl that he ran into in Ohio. Daniel's sister was actually named Joanna. I can see where the confusion was, what with Onision's tendency to use the same letter to name all of his characters, and I also didn't specifically point out that Julia was just some random person that Daniel met in Ohio. So yeah, while Onision is incredibly creepy, at least he's not into incest. Oh goody, small favors. The other point was my shirt. A lot of people seem to like it and wanted to know where to get one themselves. I don't remember where I got the shirt specifically, but if you run a simple Google search for Sexy Beast Toothless, you'll find some yourself. And that's it, let's get on with the review. <laughs> Chapter 17, Playing God. So this is where Daniel really takes the fight to the aliens. He got shot in the neck, but that was easily repaired. The real damage, <clears throat> damage, is Julia, who had been shot in the head, and she was confirmed dead. Oh, wait a minute. Even though it just said she was shot in the forehead, turns out she was actually shot through the neck and bled out. Wow, that's... It's not even a full page between mistakes. The man who shot her, he was wearing a funny costume. He must have thought very highly of himself. You know, aside from a few choice bits, Agent 47 usually likes to wear something inconspicuous like a suit with a red tie. I don't see a lot of assassins wearing funny costumes. I mean, we're not gonna get a description of it until the next page, but it was a funny costume, let me tell you. Only professional assassins here. So, the shot came from an assassin who, as the book describes, he was hired by a person who was hired by another person who was sent to employ an assassin, an assassin such as him. I knew why he was here. I could read everything about the situation I found myself into the smallest detail. Because it's easier to just blatantly shove exposition out there instead of trying to develop the scene naturally. You know, it's so much easier than having a single conversation. Here's what I don't get. Onision can detect an alien ship hidden with a cloak that he's never seen before and blow them up from who knows how far away, but he can't detect a single assassin in what might have been the suburbs? I don't even know the environment that they're in right now. All I know is that the shot came through a window in the ceiling. Also, here's, here's something really confusing. Daniel just flew to Ohio from Washington. If this assassin was hired to kill him, which apparently he was, how the hell did he get there so fast? Are there assassins just all over the globe, hired by these aliens, looking to kill him? And they're just stationed strategically? See, that part never gets explained. We don't know how he knew Daniel was gonna be here. Cause it's not like he just jumped one county over. He flew across the country, but oh boy, they've pissed off Daniel for the last time, so you know what that means. Instant badass mode. Time for punishment. Wait, I can do that better. <clears throat> Time for punishment. So Daniel watches Julia's soul leave, and it seems to kind of linger there for a moment. We love looking at ourselves as we leave. Almost like one final goodbye. Has he seen enough souls leave their bodies to know for a fact that they stare back down at their bodies? Daniel does a sweep and he changes the coding of the universe so that all the aliens hidden in human bodies would glow green so he can find them easier. He also uses some kind of non-specific force to pin the assassin against the wall and then things get really stupid. He begins his campaign against the aliens and I guess Astral projects out of his body or something and enters a new dimension or something. I, I'm not sure. It's so badly described. I forward thrusted through the wall. Pelvic thrust! 
Daniel then goes around and basically commits genocide against every alien that was hiding on the planet. Despite the fact that there was a whole ship of innocent aliens beforehand, you see, I guess it's okay to kill all of them now. There were creatures in the bodies of children. Their adopted mothers screamed at the loss of them. Some of them had fathers who cried. Some of them had no fathers at all. I pulled some of them out of buildings. I drowned some in their own bathtubs. The rest I simply separated head from body. He's a goddamn psychopath. And this is what I mean about the inconsistent powers and just how bullshit they are. If it occurred in real time, their deaths took me 17 hours and 47 minutes to accomplish. Never be that exact. It looks so dumb if you have to track something that broad, that specifically. However, this was in the other realm of existence. Thus, I was back before the assassin could let out his second scream of pain. He just genocided every th all the aliens on the entire planet in seconds. So that's the level of bullshit power we're talking about now. It gets worse. So he confronts the assassin and he kind of does uh, the, the dick dastardly mustache twirling. Eh, you will never get away with this. Fuck you, Batman. And then Daniel resurrects Julia in front of him to show that everything that the assassin had done was pointless. Daniel decides that while he has no problem committing genocide against an entire alien race, he can't justify doing the same thing with humans. The creatures from another world, they had the means to kill me. No evidence of that is demonstrated, by the way. I knew I would have to commit further genocide against them to truly protect myself. But this human? That doesn't sound insane at all. All humans? There was nothing for them to do but kneel. And now Daniel's a megalomaniac. Julie, of course, is, is relieved to see Daniel once she's revived again. You're naked, she said. I replied, and it's not just your blood that I'm drenched in, darling. That sentence takes on an entirely different meaning if you use different emphasis. Well, Daniel decides to spare the assassin and instead just sends him away. But he does so in kind of a counterproductive method. As the man passed through the walls, soaring hundreds of miles from me at thousands of miles per hour, I made sure he stayed alive. Unless Daniel did something else to shield the assassin, um, there's this, there's this little thing you gotta know about writers. Writers have to have kind of a general knowledge of whatever they talk about it, at least in layman's terms, or if they're not making it up entirely. The reason is for scenes like this. You see, okay, I will buy that Daniel has the power to shoot this assassin hundreds of miles away at thousands of miles an hour. However, without pointing it out or correcting it or anything, Daniel has done nothing to withhold the assassin from the effects of wind resistance. Yeah, you may claim that you didn't kill the man, but a person traveling unprotected at thousands of miles an hour, he no longer has skin, at the very least. I'm calling it, he's dead. That motherfucker's in pieces scattered about all over the country now. Oh, I forgot to mention this. So, Daniel's power apparently comes from this black stone somewhere in his head, and he creates another stone inside of Julia, so now she's got, like, immortality, so... That's a thing. You know, when Captain Marvel passed his power on to the rest of his family in the comics, there was at least precedent for it. After relaxing with Julia for a while, uh, the first thing Daniel starts doing is, I guess, setting things up for a polygamous relationship? Julia would have our child one day. She insisted to me and I felt her desire, but another desire existed. There were people around the world just like her. People if I had met instead of her, I could have cared for in a similar way. In other words, my girlfriend's replaceable! And oh boy, it's one of Onision's favorite things, he begins waxing philosophically. Society was like a book full of images saturated with gore and chaos. I could stomach the cover, but the moment I tried to open a single page, I felt defeated, hopeless. That is the perfect allegory for this book. Oh, and then there's this little nugget. And that was it. I decided that to truly justify taking human life, they had to be an active threat to another human life. Keep that in mind. But to cap it all off, Daniel finalizes this megalomaniacal plan to reprogram everybody. I can reprogram it all. 
She responded, lobotomize everyone? I sat there silently. No more mental illness. I'm going to cure everyone. So now Daniel has become Seymour from Final Fantasy X. Spira is a land of suffering and sorrow caught in a spiral of death. To destroy, to heal Spira, I will become sin. She added, is being damaged what makes us, us? I was at a loss. I don't want my pain taken away, I need my pain. And then Daniel goes and modifies the rest of humanity. I looked into the design of it all and I got to work manipulating the skeleton of our society. I strengthened potential victims of crimes. I designed defense mechanisms, enhanced aspects of the human body to strike back in a natural yet bold manner. Fingernails became strong as steel. There were, are no longer an imbalance between the genders. Children were given the natural inclination to know the locations of the parents, and the parents had the same connection to their children, so they could never be lost or abducted effectively. And, um... You can go ahead and just forget that, because it never shows up again. Well, okay, it shows up one time as a side comment, but by and large, what he does here doesn't matter. Oh my god. Oh, I love this chapter. This one is so fucking stupid. Chapter 18, Homecoming. So Daniel may have kidnapped Julia way back when, and there's kind of an indefinite amount of time that she was gone from home, so eventually, they have to return, and they stop by to see Julia's parents. So Daniel, Julia, and Julia's parents are sitting together for dinner when Julia's dad just asks this totally appropriate for dinner time question. So women have teeth on their crotches now, eh, Daniel? <laughs> you know, that's actually a good point. What would the international reaction to all of these completely unexplained changes be because Daniel's made no national presence no he's like he's still largely a mysterious figure operating behind the curtains in the back what would the general consensus be if all of these changes that he implemented came to pass what would the general reaction be if all the women on the planet woke up and suddenly had vagina dentata well that spurred Daniel's looking into the dad's mind and it turns out that he might have been a serial predator, specifically against young women. So Daniel just kills him. And I'm not gonna cry for the guy. Frankly, I find it hilarious because the moment I realized what he was, he dropped dead, face falling flat in his noodles. And it gets worse. The mother starts screaming in terror. The, Julia is doing the same because her boyfriend just murdered her father. And oh, Daniel decides to, to make things okay, to get Julia to understand by implanting the memories of her father attacking women into Julia's mind. It's, that, it's the straight up traumatizing right there. But it gets worse. Julia's pissed off. She understands why Daniel did what he did, but she's still pissed off and did not want him there. So Daniel, with absolutely zero self-awareness, Upon realizing I was not welcome, using the black rock in my skull, I materialized a dark coffin, one any family would be proud of. So I dropped it in the middle of their front room, and inside the coffin was a, was a buttload of money. But how goddamn morbid is that? It's like, <laughs> dinner guest walks in, murders the father, pops a coffin into existence in the middle of the living room. I am just... Aghast at how socially inept he is. And he starts running away from the situation. And it's, it's, it's still awkward. Overwhelmed with emotion, I sprinted through the trees, the bushes, even fences, breaking everything in my path. You see, I visualize that. He's just kind of stumbling through everything, not really looking where he's going, leaving Daniel-sized holes as he's crashing through people's houses. It's like something out of a cartoon, man. I, I actually, I'm kind of enjoying this now. <clears throat> With nowhere else to go, Daniel stops by home. Uh, his mom is still pissed off because of the eye explodey thingy. But she's not in great shape financially. See, she needs to sell the old house where Daniel grew up, uh, the one next to the creek. So in order to help out, Daniel buys the place.
Again, 14 years old. It was a problem I could fix. In an instant, the documents signed themselves for the sale of the house, the money transferred itself, and just like that, it all belonged to me. Now, I don't know how many of you out there have actually tried to buy a house. There's a lot of paperwork involved, and I'm kind of amused that a 14-year-old would know how to fill everything out correctly. Also, wouldn't his mom have to approve of this sale? Wouldn't she have to sign a few documents? Would, was her signature forged for this? So Daniel goes to bed for the night, but the quiet hum of death filled his ears in the creek all around him. You remember that dead woman he found several chapters ago? That's coming back in the next one. Chapter 19, Golden Man. Now, of all the chapters beforehand, this one, except for one very minor element that could have been easily rewritten elsewhere, this chapter is the most meaningless. So you remember when Daniel found that one woman's body in the creek? Well, turns out there's a whole bunch there. Daniel, using his godlike powers, was able to uncover and dig up every single body that had been buried among the entire area. Which was weird because earlier when he had uh, the magic death site, not a single one of them showed up. Especially because there were women down here. I counted 14 within a mile's radius. There's no indication if he went off somewhere in the distance. I'm assuming it's still somewhere near his house. But we don't have any hint that there were any bodies beforehand. So that sounds like Onision just wanted to put in some filler. Which just goes to my theory that he double spaced the book because it wasn't big enough. That's what she said. <laughs> well, because of his universe hacking powers, he was able to discover what had happened to all of the bodies, basically reading them and, and studying them somehow, and comes to one conclusion. I felt the bones of each person. They were all put here by the same man, Gary. Of course, Gary, who has yet to even appear in this book. Gary. After digging up all the bodies, Daniel decides to go after Gary. But when he leaves, he turns into someone else. I, I don't know why. There's no reason given. Other forces are at play at the moment, but I there's no reason why they would interfere like that. <laughs> Do you also remember when Daniel decided that he was never going to kill a person unless they were an immediate threat to another person? Well, he goes and violates that right here. Well, I mean, aside from murdering Julia's father. Using his universe hacking powers, Daniel was... Ash. Using his universe hacking powers, Daniel was able to find Gary hiding in a Christmas tree farm of all places. And let's see. Daniel rips off Gary's jaw, removes the arms, legs, and all the bones in his torso. So I guess he's really just a, a head and a chest now. Besides, now he's got a really cute nickname, Torso Boy. So what's he complaining about? So it's not just that Daniel's able to kill this man. He also tortures him terribly. Whether or not Gary deserved it is up for debate, but it is hypocritical of what Daniel said earlier. So keep that in mind. The world didn't need him in it. In a mere breath's time, he ceased to exist as anything but ash on the floor of his half-demolished house. But Gary didn't act alone. He had two people helping him. One was a guy named Raymond. Raymond died when Daniel blew up Raymond's shotgun so that the, the butt of the gun splintered into his eyes. And then Raymond was sunk into the gravel rocks beneath his feet. Ah, oh, but that's not all. You see, Raymond, a woman, I, I'm assuming Raymond's wife, it's not actually described who she is, came running out into the driveway where Raymond was murdered and asked, what did you do? Where did Raymond go? Daniel is a merciful God and gave her an answer. In a glance, I sent the woman the same images I just witnessed and without a single word from me, the woman began screaming in agony. You know, it's not just that he goes out and he kills these people when he swears that he won't. It's not just that he extracts terrible vengeance via torturing people. But the, the sheer amount of mind rape that Daniel inflicts on other people is really what makes him stand out as a compassionate deity. Then there's a third guy, Joseph. Uh, Joseph was apparently being blackmailed because Gary had kidnapped uh, Jer uh, Joseph's wife and threatened to murder her, so Joseph had to go along. Uh, he's not entirely at fault. I spoke to Joseph. 
He killed your wife. He killed her before he ever made the deal with you. And of course, uh, that makes him break down. Well, you can't just let him live with the, the terrible things, and you can't just bring his wife back from the dead. I mean, he probably could, but he doesn't want to. So instead, he just kills Joseph anyway. A man who was blackmailed into not actually hurting any of the women, just helping dispose of the bodies. Daniel's a good god. So there you go. Daniel goes out of his way to kill three people who murdered a bunch of women, dispose of the bodies near his house, and what does that do for the plot at large? Nothing! Absolutely nothing! Daniel doesn't learn anything, he doesn't grow at all, this doesn't advance his powers in any way, it doesn't expand his understanding of the universe. Frankly, the only thing this chapter does is it makes him violate his own oath, which could be a good learning experience, but he doesn't seem to actually learn anything. I guess Onision just wanted a reason for Daniel to go out and start killing people. You know, I imagine this could have been very cathartic for Onision to write, but at the same time, that doesn't mean it's good writing. Ah, but then things take a turn for the confusing when something stops Daniel and he gets abducted, but it's stronger than the aliens. Whatever it is, for the first time since gaining my abilities, I found myself completely helpless. You see, and that goes back to something that I pointed out in the This Is Why I Hate You review. You, you want to have the range of danger for your character to be within a, a certain spectrum. Forgive me for repeating myself from this, but if things are too difficult, then you're going to have to write your character out and it's going to feel cheap. If they're too easy, then there's going to be no challenge, no conflict, no real story. Onision was down here, now he's up here. Your main character was on god mode the entire book, nothing challenged him, and now that something has challenged him, it feels entirely artificial. We will find out more about that in chapter 20. God. So it turns out the thing that stole Daniel was the Angel of Death. The Grim Reaper has come along to kill our main character. And he almost managed it after a, a little bit of boring exposition. Death snaps his fingers and my blood flew in all directions, even splattering against the creature's dead stare. Oh, hold on, I corrected that. Even splattering against the creature dead stare. There we go. Now it's good and wrong. You know, that's the problem. I, the, the, I'm so used to all the bad garbage in this book that I think my brain is kind of automatically correcting some of it as I read. Well, you can't keep a good deity down, so Daniel just cheats death and resurrects himself right there on the spot. And then he creates a bubble to surround death and compresses it to the size of a marble. I created it to contain any force, including death itself. We killed this giant pterodactyl and death itself? Well, not death itself. You can't kill death. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, that makes sense. That's kind of his whole thing. Anyway. You know, the real problem with this section is just the way that death is represented. Death in the book is presented as this cold, callous, serial-killing murderer. And while you can absolutely modify the, the concept of death as this silent killer. I mean, the grim adventures of Billy and Mandy is a very easy example. But death is really much more of a benign force. It's not some evil thing. It's just a part of life. It sucks, but what are you going to do without death? What effect is this going to have on life itself? On, on just this planet alone? Is no one going to die anymore? Because after a while, you're gonna have to worry about overpopulation and natural resources are gonna run out and then Thanos' idea is going to seem very, very valid. Hashtag Thanos did nothing wrong. Frankly, this is just indicative of Onision's usual bad writing tropes. Death has just been turned into another in a long list of bullying assholes that Daniel has to come by and overcome. The Angel of Death is just another face in the crowd. How sad is it that Onision can't do anything with one of the most questioned forces of life? The Angel of Death is just a dick and nothing more. But of course, there is the matter of who sent the Angel of Death. Did he send himself? No. It turns out, Death was sent by God. So, Daniel scans God from afar. It gets very vague in terms of placement at this point, but... Daniel scans God and finds out that 
Everything we know about God is a lie, because God himself is also evil. He created evil like death, because he was evil himself. The devil never really existed as people had believed for so long. The devil was just an aspect of God's divided personality, like anyone's father when he is in his worst mood. What's with the daddy hate? And uh, forgive me, because this is a bit of a lengthy note. There are several problems with this, aside from the awkward prose and the comma splice. Death is a benign concept. If one wants to make death as a serial killer gone mad, that can work. But this assumes that death itself is an evil thing. That is extremely sophomoric thinking. Second, this connects an unlikable god to fathers again, and Onision clearly has a problem with fathers. This comes across more as projecting, with Onision conflating his hatred of religion with his hatred of his father, two of the louder complaints that he had written about in his second book. At some point, he really needs to try something else. Greg is an extremely formulaic writer, not in terms of plot or structure, but in terms of general characterization. Dads are evil, girls flock to Onision's self-insert, and the self-insert is the greatest secret badass in the history of anything. But even God is not the source of everything. God is just another son in and of itself, and he has a father. His father's name is Kull. I am not making that up. Kull was unlike God in that God was flesh through and through. Kull, however, had no flesh in his skull whatsoever. It was composed of a substance most any human would perceive as gas and dust. God's dad is made of farts. Well, Daniel could have resurrected himself the way he had so many other times, but instead he decided to use the old chunks of his body that death had blown open and create a second him. And he calls this new person the body. Again. I am not kidding. This sounds like the, the weakest pro wrestler name ever. And he gives the body the most oddly placed instructions ever. You are everything I am not. You are compassionate where I am cruel. You are true where I am lost, but you are programmed just like everything else on this earth. And despite the moral compass that Daniel just tried to put into his old corpse, the body responds pretty much robo uh, robotically to everything. So the body breaks through the barrier that death was uh, had created and was holding Daniel in, and the body soars off. Oh, I forgot to mention, um, God is actually in three pieces. I guess that's a comment on the Trinity, but that's purely speculation. But before Daniel begins this epic quest to kill God, he has to find his girlfriend. Philip Pullman, you are not, buddy. He summons Julie and she meets him... somewhere. It doesn't tell us where. It's... it's... his destination. Shit gets really vague here. We, we don't get any descriptions for anything. Places, people, things that are happening. Forget it. You could literally just picture blank walls in empty gray rooms and you'd have a pretty good idea of what the setting is like for the rest of this book. Well, despite his new appearance and the fact that he did murder her father, Julia decides to start things off with a joke between the two of them. I think you might be too old for me now, Daniel, she said with a smirk, observing my new appearance. Ha <laughs> ha! Comedy gold from the statutory rapist! I laughed and grabbed her by the throat. And no, he is not trying to murder her. That is actually how he is implanting God-killing powers into Julia. And I don't know why, because she never goes near God and she never does anything with the power. This is such a red herring. I don't think it's even an intentional red herring. Like Onision set it up so that Julia would be there to come in and help kill God or something, but he realized once this chapter was done that that would take away from Daniel's glory, so couldn't have that. No, Julia's just there to... be a woman. I can't think of anything else. I take it back, there actually is something she does. Daniel gives her the death marble, and she has to hold on to it, and... and there you go. Julia looked up and said again into my mind, anything less screwed up I can do for you, Daniel? As she wiped away her tears from the stress I caused her. What an asshole! I I'm just gonna say it now. Nothing happens because of it. He comes back, and he crushes death. The angel of death is gone. It's after the fight with God. I don't know why he just doesn't do that now. There's no reason not to kill death. 
at this point. It's, it's, there's no planning anywhere in this book. Some writers will take years to write a book, a single book. George R. R. Martin is a great example of that. Come on, man, where's book six? Anyway, but it turns out the body had already killed the first god fragment, and Daniel had to hurry if he was going to kill the other two. Chapter 21, The Hand, Hand of, of God. God. Hovering above. Onision really just uses his super universe coding powers to avoid having to explain anything. Check this out. I now stood behind a man who looked like what most anyone would imagine God to be. That is the, the intro to this area. I don't know if they're in a room, if they're outside, if they're in the clouds, if they're in space, if there is in, in some weird metacosmic concept land. And the description for God is not much better. A white silhouette that flickered black to white stood before me, a massive yellowish gold light beamed from around him. So God is a flickering light bulb. Daniel tries to attack, but God immediately counters with energy. It's the best we got. But before anything really happens, the body flies in and knocks God around in Strangely enough, the body has grown like five times his original size. Cause shut up. That, that's probably the sum of Onision's defense to this whole thing. Hey, how come God doesn't make any sense in your book? Shut up. The setup of God in this book is a good demonstration of how limited Greg's imagination is. He has all these ideas, which if properly fleshed out could be good ones, but he doesn't uh, see them through or connect them logically. Why is God in three pieces? Why does God fear Daniel? Why does Daniel have these powers at all? If Daniel is as overpowered as God is, then why can't God just snap his fingers and turn Daniel's mind off or kill him in any number of ways? Why does God have a dad? Is he just some other kid who got powers like this? If so, how and why? If God really wanted to kill Daniel, how come he doesn't just put him inside of a black hole? And later on, we discover that God's been trying to kill Daniel for years, ever since, well, rather he's wanted Daniel dead for years. Why didn't he just put baby Daniel inside of a black hole? or in the middle of a star. There are a number of ways you can kill a child, God. It's not that difficult. And why wait to kill Daniel? His powers have manifested at this point. There was a while back when Daniel was just waking up his powers and, and you could have stepped in then. Anytime, why didn't you? This is such bad plot development. Roger Ebert did not create the the term idiot plot, but he did popularize it. You see, an idiot plot is the kind of story that can only happen if everyone involved, or at least a large portion of them, are idiots. This book is one long idiot plot. Anyway, back to the fight. So, I don't know what happens. I've read this section like three times, and I, I know what's described. I just don't get it. I think what actually happened is Onision was writing this scene, had a vague idea of where he wanted to go, and never actually fleshed it all out. Let me, let me demonstrate. I heard a scream like I had never heard before. It wasn't coming from the body. I looked up with my failing eyes and saw God's hand explode into bloody shards for everyone to see. He had attempted to strike the body down, yet his violence turned on him tenfold without any reaction from the body. Why? God then tries to swing a sword to decapitate the body, but God slows down and just eventually winds up still, like he's paralyzed. And then he crumbles into dust. That is such a lame fight, because no one even really hit anybody. And there's no real reason for how God's violence turned against him? What does that mean? We learn it a bit that the body got, well, he got thoroughly destroyed when he tried to take on the first God chunk, and it allowed him to reprogram himself with super extra God-killing powers, and now I guess he can just do it without thinking. This is phenomenally bad writing. I am now so thoroughly convinced that Daniel will win this bout that I can't possibly get any kind of enjoyment. There's no sense of thrill. There's no sense that he might die. You know, even in Harry Potter, in the first book, you, you, you're pretty sure 
that Harry's gonna make it out okay. Because it's book one of seven, and his name is on the front of every book. But you're still invested because he's a growing boy. And this is a, the, the fight in the end of that was a big revelation for him. So it would have been a deeply scarring emotional battle at that point. We don't get that from this book. We don't get physical danger, mental danger, emotional danger, anything like that. It's just Daniel wants to kill God. So he does. Killing God is cool. Yeah. Then he puts on sunglasses and the big leather jacket and he rides his motorcycle into the sunset and Onision asks, am I cool yet? That is the underlying theme of this entire thing. Onision just wants to be cool. Understandable. It, it's, a, it's a totally relatable goal, but <laughs> this is how you do it. Uh, I just keep getting distracted. I am tired. Two chunks of God have been killed, one left to go. It was clear the body had defeated the second half of God. What kind of Al Gore bullshit math is this? It is half man, half bear, and half pig. So the body starts repairing Daniel. Out of sheer loyalty, reprograms Daniel so that Daniel is now on par with God's father. It's basically, the book sums it up as, you need an upgrade. There you go, you've got an upgrade. The body smiled and replied, only this time he spoke directly to my mind, sharing exactly what I needed to do to become like him. I immediately took advantage of the information he provided. Within seconds, I felt like my whole mind was being pulled into quicksand, and slowly after it, the remainder of my entire existence, my body, everything. That's it. Daniel has reached peak levels of God mode. So that means we have an overpowered 14-year-old, his overpowered reanimated corpse, going up against the last third of God. So how does this epic conclusion start? Where is the last fragment hiding? Irrelevant! Because Onision doesn't feel like setting up anything. The, the empty, meaningless void that they're currently standing in? Daniel just farts and God is brought to him. With a mere thought, he had delivered the last God to us. Already paralyzed, but clearly very much so awake. They then turned this moment into interrogate God and make him the bad guy. Again, there is an idea at the core concept here. Uh, an interesting story idea I heard years back would be, what if God was actually the bad guy the whole time and the devil was the good guy, just not as strong? It's There's a concept there. There's an interesting story there, but Onision doesn't know how to set any of that up. Instead, it's just, oh, bad things happen, and I can blame you. This just becomes Greg whining at religion for the umpteenth time. There is no tension in anything here. There's no setup, there's no impact, and there's minimal substance. I am incredibly bored. You invented everything wrong with this world. Countless humans and other animals have been slaughtered under your watch, children dying of cancer, mothers crying as their half-formed children fall from their bodies, innocent people drowning in your floods, burning in your fires. Tell me, God, how uh, does the devil even really exist? Because I can't sense him anywhere. Uh, so it turns out that the devil was just a, uh, a story that God made up to explain away his own evils. Oh, but it gets dumber! So not only was God a creation of Cull, God also had a sister, and you took her life right before the first genocide you committed against her creations. God screamed as spit poured out his mouth. How can you possibly know that? And then he creates a new paragraph in the middle of a sentence. He actually does that surprisingly often. But wait, it gets dumber. God not only killed his sister, he also violated her body. He killed her in his own shame as a result of what he did to her. Oh my god, this is so lame. Religion automatically means rape in Onision's mind. You know, after a while, even the most militant atheist would look at this and say, Dude, enough with the religion bashing. So, there's only one thing left for Daniel to do. He and the body go on a road trip to go find Cull. I guess so they can call Cull. 
Chapter 22. We're almost done, guys. The mother of a better world. Well, there's a big question of where would you find the father of God? Though, frankly, Call is uh, described as the god of gods. He's apparently the absolute height of the universe's hierarchy. And locating him, of course, would be a tremendous challenge. Actually, super easy. Barely an inconvenience. But in fact, chronology was my first strategy to locate him, and the strategy was effective. God forbid Daniel have to struggle in something! And Cull is basically a sad man sitting on a throne. The only bit of description we get, and we are told that we are in a room, but the only description we get of the place beyond that is, the room was surrounded with indentations in the gray stone walls, it was the basic code I first learned to modify basic elements in my life. Within seconds, I identified the code as the different variations of Cull's daughter. So that means there are more than one variation of the daughter. So there was more than one daughter? Or there were clones of her? But rather than just walk in and try to murder the god of gods, because wouldn't that be cool, Daniel decides to be sympathetic. He asks Cull what's going on, why everything, and Cull just answers that he's very sad and he misses his daughter. Apparently, the daughter wanted a brother of equal status so badly, so Cull created God using his own life force. I guess that's how you make gods. Although, and this gets revealed later on, other planets also have gods, so does that mean that Cull made those gods or there are other Culls, and if so, who made Cull? This is another reason why editors are important. They can go and they can ask all sorts of questions of your world building, and then you can realize, sometimes it doesn't make sense and you gotta think it out. Well, apparently Cull is running out of life force and is not able to properly rebuild his children, even if he could. That wouldn't work well enough. So the reason God was such a fuck up and was evil was because Cull didn't have enough life force to properly put into him. Daniel reads Cull, I guess, because this isn't presented in dialogue, is just another of what feels like thousands of exposition dumps. Cull created God with his own life force, but Cull, having so little left, made mistakes, leaving him powerless to correct them and powerless to help his daughter if they ever were at odds. I don't know why a deity like that would really be concerned about life force or why that would be a thing. I mean, how many trillions of years old would Cull have to be? And where did Cull come from if he is not the origin of all things? Now, the life force thing does explain why Cull doesn't bring back his daughter and God, or try to fix him, and, you know, that is like one aspect that's almost fine. But the question is, why doesn't Daniel? And that one does get answered. I imagined using my power to bring his children before him, only leaving the aspects of God's corrupt code behind, but I knew Cull would not be satisfied without his authentic, original children. And then he completely disregards that on the very next page. Daniel just uses the code that's lying around and makes another daughter. I spoke aloud. You won't need to remember your daughter anymore, Cull. She's standing next to you. And then they hug, and it's happy. But do you remember what I said about Onision being bad with descriptions? Well, he describes Cull's daughter thusly. This woman was beyond description. I had seen no one like her before. That was it. Her description is, she's a woman. But you think that was lame? This is worse. Cull's daughter? does not have a name! She is never referred to by anything else other than Cull's daughter. Well, one other thing, but I'll get to it. Seeing them reunited, knowing their troubles were mostly behind them, I felt confident in the future they would influence without God to end what the world was, or his own sister once more. You just said that Cull would not be satisfied without his original daughter. I don't care how Onision wants to say, oh, it's just a copy of her original cl uh, coding. Yeah. That makes her a clone. This is not inconsistent writing. This is a blatant fuck up. Anyway, chapter 23, The Black Nightmares. Now, through all of that, through that extremely blase, in your face description of killing God, one may have a question. What about the aliens? Why were they there? And honestly, I thought Onision had forgotten about them and wasn't going to actually answer that, but he does. Yes, it's dumb. So Daniel goes and finds Julia. They, you know, 
Uh, then he destroys the death marble. Looks like Julia's finally forgiven him for killing her father. I went silent for a moment, and then after thought I spoke again. Well, the next morning it turns out that Cull's daughter had been busy recreating the world. And Onision wanted to set this up so that it would be this, this nice, perfect utopia. Heaven on Earth. This would terrify me. And I'm not saying that to be facetious or cute or anything. It's, it's genuinely worrying. I searched the code of prisons, military bases, even cancer hospitals, and they were all gone. Are military bases really on par with prisons? Okay, fine. All that sounds nice. But... Cull's daughter had done what I was afraid to do. She didn't acknowledge opinions or cultures and simply rebuilt the world in the way she deemed fit. Cull's daughter just rampantly changed everything to her idealized version of perfection. Everyone else's opinions and accomplishments meant nothing. At that point, she is just an all-powerful totalitarian. You mean that people's entire ways of life have been wiped out just because she didn't like it? Like, which ones? How many plays, artworks, buildings, and holidays were just lost because of one ego-driven bent? How is this a happy conclusion? And Cull's daughter says that Daniel can do whatever he wants, but he is not allowed to affect the code of the world. So he decides to just go off and do his own thing for a while. With the new god of Earth managing everything, I had time to dig deeper into this world. You committed a global genocide of aliens hidden in plain sight in the time it took a single man to scream. Time is not a factor for you. So Daniel and the body go off to space and they find the alien home planet. They interrogate him for a little while, and it's very, very vague. They put an alien commander inside of a cage, and the cage acts as a translator, apparently, because shut up. And after some interrogation, they discover what the alien's motivation was. Much of the population of this planet was built on fear. They were so afraid of outside powers that that had entire space programs to seek out and destroy sources of energy coming from creatures that were or could become more powerful than them. And then immediately, the body explains, I see God had dealt with these creatures before. Looking at the code, I see both him and you cross paths when you were just a baby. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, an all-powerful deity was afraid of an infant. God had arranged for these aliens to figure out a way to kill me before I could even talk. Again, so many ways to imprison him. Put him inside of a black hole so that he couldn't escape a singularity. The code revealed that God could crack the rock in my head, but never destroy it entirely as it would always regenerate. Wow! That's convenient! Put him inside of a temporal lock then. If he can't move, grow, or think, he can't be a threat. All right. Oh, but... It gets dumber. Also, if the aliens sought out powers greater than their own, why didn't they go after God? Why did they agree to work with him? God had the same powers and energy, and God was enough of a vindictive little shit that he would have wiped out their home planet. None of this was thought through. The universe has way more scary stuff in it than basic as fuck aliens. Oh, but wait, are you ready for it to get dumber? Because it gets dumber. I know, we haven't hit the bottom of the hole yet. The body discovered something, pulling code out of his ass, I guess, and makes a unique discovery. See, there's there's been the question that I haven't bothered posing, and that's where the hell did these powers come from? Uh, sure, we've got that little black rock in Daniel's head, but where'd the black rock come from? Where, where's the origin of all that stuff? And for the longest while, I thought it wasn't going to get answered, but it does. And it's as dumb as you think. Daniel, your physical code starts at the date of your birth. But the stone in your head has a code that was created much further back with your mother, your original mother. His mother is the new god of Earth. Okay, couple of questions. Does that mean that God is his dad and that Daniel is the result of rape? How did Daniel grow up as an 11 year old if his mom had died thousands of years ago? How did Daniel wind up with his human mom? Why didn't the god mom want anything to do with him? And I'm not just pulling that out of my ass. The book actually says that. The mother I was born of wanted nothing to do with me, and the mother who created me didn't bother to ever tell me who I was or anything outside where these aliens were. 
So Daniel erases all memory of himself from the aliens and sends them back to their home planets and then goes back home himself. And the body makes several jokes about how Daniel thought his godmom was attractive and insert Oedipus joke here. Final chapter, chapter 24, Mother. This chapter is really just two pages of resolution. It, nothing really significant happens. Godmom is taking care of everything and everything's all super happy dory. Uh, Julia and Daniel are talking about having a baby and making their relationship more official. I'm just gonna assume it's been long enough that they're both legal at this point because it's disgusting otherwise. You're a sick man, Greg. What the fuck is wrong with you? And Godmom's been busy. The economy was designed for the well-being of all. TV shows no longer reflected drama from our own planet, but were most all based on what life was like on other planets with other gods. So is that all that was wrong with the world? Just bad TV and fixing the economy because like nothing else needed repair? Also, how is everyone generally taking the information that there are other planets with life on them? and gods. Uh, he still has not seen his family in so long because his mom still doesn't like the eyeball thing. So I guess polytheism is a thing. How do people argue about this? I, what has religion been on the planet? Also, what about the aliens? Do the aliens have a god that they follow? How does that work? Does every world get a god or just the ones with life? Can gods make more than one world? Why are some gods good and some evil? Corrupted coding? The whole thing really makes me question poor Sargeras. Hey, it really does, there's some really wasted potential there. If there are other gods, and as the book describes, they are corrupt, then why doesn't Daniel just soar through the stars killing them? There you go. Daniel, god killer. You're welcome, Greg. I just went and made your sequel for you, and it's a hundred times cooler than this book. And Daniel decides not to affect the coding of the planet or the people whatsoever, because his mom is perfect. I didn't need to, as my original mother was perfect, and no matter how much I evolved, she would still be wiser than me. And that's the last sentence in the book. That doesn't really wrap anything up. It's kind of a weak ending. It's an extremely weak ending. It doesn't resolve much. It seems like the last breath wasted on this book was Greg saying that he loved his mom, which, I mean, it, it's sweet, but it doesn't make for good storytelling. I'm starting to wonder if Greg has a real life of Oedipus complex. Okay, that was, that was Reaper's Creek. Awful. Everything was awful. There were like two good lines that I found, and that was, that was about it. There is no character arc, there is no world building, there is no place setting, there are barely any descriptions, Godmom doesn't get a name. There are a thousand dead ends in the plot and the characters. Daniel is creepy as hell. There's... He was 12! You fucking moron! I've seen... Wattpad fanfictions that are so much better than this. As much as I dreaded going through Twilight and Fifty Shades of Grey, as awful as those books are, and they are awful, this is so much worse. I mean, the love story in this, Twilight's a better love story than this. It's been done. Twilight is no longer the worst standard. Ugh. That is just disgusting. Uh, there's a few notes that I may have missed first. Book actually has a small nugget of promise at the start. It's clumsy and needs an editor, but Greg manages to open the world and describe it decently enough. Then he goes full Greg. You went full. Onision. Never go full. Onision. Daniel has lentils for dinner. I'm, I'm not gonna make fun of that, but... It's a common food stuff in all of Greg's writing. This book is all about filler and bad character introductions. Uh, there's a line I missed here. Page 37, immediately my hero complex was gaining momentum. Well, at least he's honest about it. Page 38, Daniel threatens bullies. He is exactly the same as James and Arthur. Onision only knows how to create a single type of protagonist. 
Daniel sleeps in the laundry and boiler room, but still has space for a TV and a PlayStation there. Uh, the scene with the pregnant lady with a stillborn baby. Daniel describes his experience with a dead baby inside the pregnant lady. Uh, how it happened right in front of me. How what happened in front of him? How a lady was nervous and cried? <laughs> I overlooked this one. When the alien kid was standing outside of Daniel's room, we get this golden line. He was staring right back at me through my tiny square wooden framed bedroom window. Take the pot off your head, Daniel, screamed the alien. Oh. And that was after we got a description of Daniel being seduced by an older woman. The entire chapter makes me uncomfortable. Daniel beats Julia in a game of darts, despite never having played it before, because GREG MUST BE THE BEST IN ALL THINGS OR THE UNIVERSE WILL CEASE TO MAKE SENSE! Uh, there's a line, I believe this is when Daniel is being abducted. I let go of my weight, mentally and emotionally. How does one do that? Random sentence, I could feel walls that did not even exist before my eyes. Context won't help. Trust me. Uh, Daniel gets blown up by the alien ship at one point. My arms, my legs, my upper body, they were all gone in an instant. Like a bird in the wind. Another random sentence. Lost in thoughts over what had happened beyond the comprehension of most the people who were visiting me, I had an epiphany. You know what, Onision? Don't proofread your work. You're giving me so much stuff to make fun of. Onision doesn't understand how to make a true underdog story. He wants to be beaten down, but still cool, but just comes off as a tryhard instead. Spider-Man does this much better. Peter Parker, at least in the versions where he's in high school, is kind of a lonely kid with incredible responsibilities and ends up saving the day, despite being a social pariah. But he doesn't let that stop him from putting others first and setting his own problems aside to do the right thing. Daniel is so self-consumed that even when he thinks he's doing the right thing, like releasing the mind control he had on everyone, it all comes back to him. And he's the victim. He's the most important person in this. Pity him. Boo-hoo. The entire thing with the assassin was what's wrong with an overpowered character. If you don't know what you're doing, you have to make your character an idiot to keep the plot moving. Uh, during the scene with the assassin, when Julia was resurrected, Julia comes back from the dead, so now her death has no consequence. Daniel was able to easily return her soul back to her body and heal her, without much thought, as the book describes. If he could do that the whole time, then why the large outburst? This is functionally the same thing as crying over spilled milk. His genocide just looks like an over-the-top reaction now. If he didn't know that he could resurrect Julia, that'd be one thing. But Daniel acts so nonchalant and even states outright that he wanted to show the assassin that shooting, uh, the shooting had been pointless. So yeah, the genocide thing, total overreaction. Daniel admits to being a megalomaniac, all humans, there was nothing for them to do but kneel. Daniel rewrites humans like in a video game mod. He basically rewrites an Elder Scroll. He says it's to give potential victims strengths to balance things out, but won't that just shift the balance of power to the other person's direction? The person with the steel fingernails could become a serial stabber. Also, how will the people take these dramatic changes? Will there be chaos, discussions, panic? Somehow, in Anision's writing, I doubt it. Daniel changes Julia to make her comfortable. He's completely psychotic and just alters his girlfriend to make himself feel better. This has terrible implications. Anytime there's an issue or conflict between them, Daniel can just brainwash Julia without a second thought and turn her into whatever he wants her to be. This degree of thinking is insane, and if that were the point of the book, it would work out really well. But it's not, so it doesn't. We also later see that he keeps Julia away from her parents for a long period of time. Does she not question this or ask to go back? Does he stop her from wanting to? Does Greg know how creepy this is? There's a scene where they're flying back to Julia's parents' house and Daniel's pants keep falling off, so he keeps manifesting them. And Julia asks, If you can just make them with your mind, why not make pants that don't fall when we fly? And that was an attempt at a joke, but it's actually a good question, especially because suspenders exist. Uh, more on Julia's parents. Uh, Julia's parents apparently were not fond of Daniel. Then brainwash them. You've done it so many times to so many other people. Who cares? When they arrive, Julia's dad throws an axe at Daniel, nearly hitting Julia, who was standing right behind him. Just... Who fucking does that? Uh, Daniel kills Julia's pedophile father. So, uh, Daniel manifests a coffin for Julia's dad right after murdering him. Um, buddy, you can read minds. You should know that that isn't normal. 
Uh, we get this line. If I wanted to, my grandmother's breathing could be heard next door if I really tried. Learn punctuation. Daniel's powers are whatever he needs them to be. Daniel is not a Gary Stew. Daniel's a godly stew. The body not only transcended godhood and killed two god fragments without effort, but taught Daniel how to ascend, which was apparently something he could do within seconds and on his own. God fragment one got scooched into a paste. At one point, the body explains he altered God One's coding, but earlier, the body explained that gods existed on a plane beyond coding. So, how could the body affect coding where none was supposed to exist? Everything with the God plot is terrible and meaningless. God's sister apparently made perfect humans, then out of jealousy, God raped her. Then out of shame uh, for the rape, God killed her. Then he started telling his life story as some good versus evil duality that became the Bible, so that God was both himself and Lucifer. All of this backstory means nothing to Daniel or his situation, and it doesn't change him from his course. It's just written to shame the Christian God. Again. Because Onision is a one-trick pony. Cull does explain why God was fucked up, but that puts a damper on the whole God of Gods thing. Especially if there was only God and his unnamed sister. Kind of makes Cull look impotent if he has to use his own life force to create children. Just look at the Greeks! Their gods were born via cutting their heads with axes! That's how Athena was born when Hephaestus took an axe to crack open Zeus's skull. Greek myth is weird. Worst book ever. I don't care what you say, it cannot get worse than this. No world building, no consistency, no stakes, no depth, no meaning, no impact, no substance, and no characters. Barely even a story. Kid gets overpowered and kills God because why not? Oh my god, this is the, the ultimate literary endurance test. And I made it through. I am done with it. But, despite that, this has been an interesting challenge, and a lot of good for my channel. We uh, recently hit over 50,000 subscribers. A big welcome to everyone, because thanks to Anision, I have more than doubled the size of my channel. So, hats off to you, Greg. First round is on me. And I think I'm going to actually change the way I do things on the channel now. I'm going to be doing more of these long-form, terrible book rants, because you guys seem to like it. I kind of have fun. Well, when it's not Onision, I seem to have fun with this kind of thing. But I've had plenty of suggestions for more books to go after. Now, I am going to keep doing this. I'm just not sure which book I want to go after next. Because you guys have just given me so many good suggestions, so many terrible books I can hit. And, oh, you know there's a lot more than just this. Look, I've got an entire box set. Well, there is one book that just came out that is done by a rather infamous author that I think I'm going to tackle next. And hopefully I can catch you guys next time for E.L. James' The Mister. This one's already getting shit reviews.